All right, so if I can turn that on, please. I will be talking about globalization in the University of English <coughs> Language Classroom, looking at it from a critical discourse analysis perspective. So let me talk first about that last term, which may be unfamiliar. It's a branch of linguistics that takes part of its uh, source from discourse analysis, meaning the analysis of texts larger than a sentence, but adding the idea of critical theory, um, which um, is critical in the sense of criticism. So the best kind of summary I've seen of that is by Ruth Vodak, who says, CDA aims to investigate critically social inequality as it is expressed, signaled, constituted, legitimized, and so on by language use or discourse. So for researchers like myself, who see significant systemic inequality in the world um, and want to understand where it comes from, in my case looking at that from a specifically language-based perspective um, and looking how these inequalities are perpetuated and ideally looking for ways that they're resisted and thus make the world a better place. Uh, the texts I'm looking at are lesson plans, uh, specifically lesson plans that come from uh, Jout's The Language Teacher, which is um, uh, JALT is the Japan Association for Language Teaching. It's one of the larger professional organizations of language teachers here in Japan. This is their journal that they publish six times per year. And in each of those, or in most of those issues, there is a section called My Share. Now, the My Share are short, about 700 word articles. And they're not research papers. What they are instead is they're an author saying, here's an activity I did in my class. And here's why I feel it was successful and what was successful about it, with usually a little bit of justification. And then mostly it's a set of procedures for how to replicate that in the classroom. It's a kind of teacher lore put into print. Um, the reason why I think this is a useful site to look at when we're considering ideology in the classroom is because um, I think an, a lesson plan really represents an ideal of what the teacher thinks is a good class, right? They're saying this is what is good about language teaching. And so I think that really helps us understand issues of teacher ideology and teacher beliefs. Now, the uh, time period I'm looking at is from 2011 to 2016. Uh, there were 204 activities in that time period. But uh, because context is very important for this kind of analysis, I cut out any articles that were made for young learners and any which were from institutions outside of Japan. Uh, since I, as a university English professor myself, that's the place I feel most comfortable uh, analyzing. And that's left me with 177 activities. Now, that's still a substantial set of data. It's over 100,000 words. So I'm using a variety of tools. One of them is the standard textual analysis that comes out of Foucault, Norman Fairclough that we see in this kind of critical analysis but also adding to that what's called corpus analysis, which is where you use computational tools to understand a large body of text as a whole. And specifically, I'm taking a lot of my um, approach from Paul Baker, who talks about the idea of using them in complementary fashion, basically iterating, where you often start with the corpus search to look up keywords or collocations, and then from that, go into detailed textual analysis, and that might trigger some interesting ideas that we want to go back to the whole corpus. It is not a linear approach to analysis. It is iterative. It is, like all research, it's subjective, but it's very uh, open about being interpretive and subjective. So today, I'm going to be, this is part of a big project for me, where it's actually my PhD research, but I'm going to focus on the issues of globalization and internationalization. Um, because that's the topic of our conference, and, and not just this one. There's like five conferences in Japan and Asia this year alone that are using this as their theme. The reason for that is, of course, that this has been a big issue in Japanese education for at least the 1980s, but especially since uh, Kokusaika was put directly into the course of study, the Japanese uh, um, uh, governing document for all education. Now, Kokusaika is often translated as internationalization, but there's been a lot of, uh, not a, lot, a substantial bit of research, especially by Hashimoto and Kubota, who argue that that's really not a very good translation for Kokusaika. In fact, Hashimoto goes so far as to say is that we should probably call it Japanization. That really what the Japanese government is looking for is giving students the tools that enable their future employers the ability to successfully interact with companies internationally. And the Japanese 
country as a whole to be able to interact on this kind of global political stage, but not any of the sorts of ideas we often think about, like multiculturalism or global citizenry, that in fact there's a very strong drive to build a strong Japanese identity which is protected from international influence. So it's a very neoliberal business approach to internationalization, but not uh, a cultural one. So, but nonetheless, it is a common topic. We hear it all the time in the education field. Does it show up in this corpus? And the answer is no, not really. Only 11 instances of these words, and two of them are actually like references to companies. So only nine times is this mentioned. So this topic is not being taken up directly by these authors. But nonetheless, I think that when we look at some of the details and some other linguistic traces, we can find ideologies and identity issues in this corpus. So, um, the, of the articles that did include this terminology, I broke them into three categories. Uh, ones that talk about the environment, ones that talk about business, and ones that talk about international communication. We're only going to have time to touch on just one from each category today. So in the environmental, there's two that just mention it in passing. One with a very positive approach to globalization where students really look at how their local behaviors have an impact on global resource use. But one with a really very negative uh, interaction between uh, the issues and the ideology. So this is an activity where students looked at endangered animals. And the teacher has the students create a poster presentation about an endangered animal. And this teacher very strictly restricts what the students can talk about. Uh, they talk about what this, the animals eat and where they live and only a phrase or so talking about why they're endangered. The teacher also strictly li limits their time and doesn't provide any opportunity for discussion. So the problem with, I mean, the reason I'm sure the teacher did that is because that's hard stuff. I mean, that's probably, they're, I'm guessing they're thinking that it may be beyond the level of their students. They may also be worried about time when you have a whole class giving poster presentations. But the consequence of introducing a controversial topic and then treating it on a surface level is to normalize that as just the way the world is. There just are endangered animals. It has nothing to do with us, right? Whereas, of course, I mean, we know if we think about it, in, animals are endangered almost entirely because of people like us who live in first world countries who demand cheap goods and offload our environmental concerns to other countries. Um, and so I'm not saying that you wouldn't want to talk about that in a freshman English class, but by not talking about it and yet still talking about the topic, you create the image that, in fact, this is just acceptable. The business activity uh, gets into the issue of co-modification of English and uh, local culture. Co-modification means the transformation of something into a commodity. Now, this is quite common in business English because it often, it, depending on how it's phrased, students are taught things for the benefit of their companies. Like they're given skills that allow their companies to make more money. But that's to some degree inherent in business English, although if you phrase it differently, you can talk about the benefits students get as they themselves uh, can have in the marketplace. But that this activity goes a little beyond that because specifically it asks the students to pretend their company wants to do an international project. They've got foreign clients <coughs> coming to Japan. And their job is to find three local entertainment places to take these foreign clients so that they will be happy and they'll want to invest in the Japanese company. Well, what that can very easily do is co-modify Japanese culture. Because if you think, probably the students, at least some of the things they're going to find are local temples and shrines and local um, performances. And what it does is it makes those as nothing more valuable than a way for their corporate over their companies to make money. And that's that is that's neoliberalism. I mean, that's the whole idea that everything in the world exists to drive business interests, and that's what makes the world better. And that's an ideology, as you can probably tell. It's not an ideology I agree with. Um, and so, but I'm assuming it's one that probably the author didn't specifically consider. Lastly, coming to international communication, there was one in passing, two very positive, um, one where the students kind of investigate what does it mean that we have this YouTube thing, that we can interact with cultures across the world, but what does it mean that we kind of do that in English, and what are the consequences of that? 
Another one also very positive where this talks about bringing international students into the English language classroom in Japan. And the reason I want to bring that up is because I want to contrast it with a different activity that has, it's almost the same activity, but very different kind of phrasing. So this one, again, international students coming into the lessons, into the English language classrooms here. The other one talks about bringing native English speakers into the Japanese classroom. That's already a big difference. There's a big divide there. That sets up this binary. There's native speakers who are competent and non-native speakers who are deficient. And this is something that a lot of teachers, um, uh, some, some teachers are trying to work against. But it gets worse than that. Um, this activity specifically refers to US students doing a short-term study abroad. As we just saw, less than 1.5% of international students are from the US. And it's not that that's just what this person has. The person, the author goes so far as to say, if you don't have those students, doesn't, don't consider the other international ones, set up a Skype call with the university in the US. <laughs> those are clearly the only value. No one else, the, any, all the other 80% from Asia have no value to this teacher. And even more so, it, the structure, the activity has the international students formally interview the Japanese students. In other words, putting the international students in the dominant position. The Japanese students become the passive informants about Japanese culture and Japanese university life which again re-emphasizes this hierarchy between Japan and internationals and native and non-native speakers. The other activity, on the other hand, specifically calls for a variety of nationalities. It says that makes the class more lively and specifically recognizes they may not or probably won't be native English speakers, whatever that means. And the activity puts everyone on a much more equal footing. The, together, they discuss some topics that the teacher has created. Now that is also a hierarchy, but it's one that's kind of almost ubiquitous in education where the teachers are control the students are. So again, I don't mean to, pick, I'm not trying to pick on say this author is bad. This author, both of these authors are relying upon the language that they have available to them. Um, part of critical discourse analysis is that we don't so much make choices about what we write, but the choices are made for us by the language we have available. But nonetheless, we need to investigate that to understand um, why the situations exist they do. So uh, speaking of that iterative approach I had before, that seeing this mentioned specifically US students, I was curious, well, going back to the whole corpus, what locations are represented in the corpus? What locations and nationality, both national and subnational? And the first, I, this is a, where the computer is really helpful because I can get it to pull out all the proper nouns in the, the survey and I can check each one of them. Um, first, we see that 61% are referring to Japan. Now, that's not so surprising. What that really tells us is that the authors and editors perceive their audience as mainly other language teachers in Japan. That's why they say things like Japanese university students do not to not this thing. But the non-Japan is more interesting. Um, we might hope, if it's an international corpus, that we see a wide variety of countries listed. Perhaps we might see an Asian focus, uh, as, as Komer Sensei mentioned. That's, for a large part, who businesses are going to need their students to interact <coughs> with in the future. But that's not at all what we see. Instead, 65% of the location and nationality references are to the US. And in fact, some of the rest of these, the Vietnam, that's four references to the movie Good Morning Vietnam, which is an American movie about the Vietnam War. The Australia references are all to, it's one activity where the students compare living in Sydney to living in New York. So there's this dominance of the United States in this corpus. And this is consistent with many other aspects of Japanese education, as we just saw. There's been studies that looked at um, middle school textbooks in Japan, and those are dominated by, by US English, uh, by North American speakers, and by culture <coughs> linked to North America. Um, and so that is, of course, in large part, is linked to the unique socio-political history of Japan and the US, which Japan does not have with other countries since uh, World War II, or since before, since, Japan, since the US invaded Japan uh, 100 years ago. Um, but nonetheless, it's not international, in, not in the sense that we normally mean the word international. All right, another consideration then is another proper noun that shows up is the issue of 
um, languages. So what languages are represented in this corpus? Well, again, we see the overwhelming dominance of English. Again, as, just as we just saw in more detail in the previous presentation, 75% or so English. The references of Japanese are almost entirely either about unique features of Japanese language versus English language, or how to use Japanese in the English language classroom. And then just a couple others. And I'm sure that if this fact were pointed out to the majority of readers, the JAL members who read these articles, they'd be like, well, yeah, of course, you know, we're here to teach English. But technically speaking, Japan is the Japan Association for Language Teaching. It's not an English teaching. There is, there's a separate one, so Japan Association for College English Teachers that is English only. But JAL has this only tiny fraction of non-English teachers. This is... English dominating the conversation of foreign languages, just like that. <coughs> and this is not an accident. This is built into the course of study. If we look at when the course of study added English to the elementary school level, um, the course of study, the main, the highlighted parts are always that they're adding foreign language activities. But if you look at some of the other parts, they say, yeah, but they should probably be English. And the only approved course book, at least when they first introduced it, was an English course book. All of the training teachers who go to teachers' colleges receive is about how to teach English. And so there has been no move. It is, it is by design that English dominates the language, uh, the language education here in Japan. All right, I want to turn to kind of a separate topic, but moving away from the linguistic analysis over to a pedagogical analysis, because one of the things that, uh, again, if we're thinking about in terms of globalization, is this issue of collaboration versus competition. And the reason I brought this up is because when I first kind of read through all the different articles as I prepped the data, is that it seemed like there were an awful lot of competitive games. And so, I, but of course, in, interpretation, impressions might not be accurate. So I went and, and counted them, and I categorized the activities as solo activities or team activities and collaborative or competitive. And it turns out that actually about 70% of the activities are collaborative. Students working together to have discussions in pairs or groups. Only about 20% of the activities are competitive. Uh, of those competitive ones, uh, about two-thirds of them are intergroup, meaning team competitions, and uh, the balance are solo competitions. Um, so that's actually not that high, but it kind of is. <laughs> Because if you imagine literally every other class at a university outside of a sports class, there's going to be 0% competition. I don't think there's ever a math class where students at the university level, where students engage in competition, or a history class, or a science class, certainly not any lecture-focused class. And again, this is not something unique to Japan. I never did games in my classes in the United States when I went to undergraduate, undergraduate there. My worry with this, I should say worry, I do games in my classes. I do less than I used to because I have reasons, and the authors have reasons, and one of the things I'll want to investigate later is what are their reasons for doing them. But my concern is if the only place students engage in competitive activities outside of sports classes is in the English language classes they have, that's going to either reinforce the idea that English speakers or Americans are argumentative and debate focused, whereas Japanese people are harmonious and group building, that common mythology, which sociologists have shown is not particularly accurate, at least not in a detailed sense. Or it might reemphasize the idea that international relations are inherently competitive. And we can see this, you know, when this can come up in the rhetoric of governments where it's like, can Japan compete with other countries? And are we succeeding or failing in our education? And so that is an additional concern that we're going to view international life that way. So I'm almost out of time here. Um, in summary, again, I'm not trying to criticize any individual activity, any individual authors. But what I am concerned is what is going on in this kind of discourse? And what does this do for the teachers who are reading this and saying, oh, this is how I should act, and this is how I should behave in my classes. This is what's ideal. And so I, I'm hoping, as I do more research in this, to be able to provide some advice about how both JALT in their journal can either at the editorial level or the authorial level provide activities that are ideologically less potentially harmful, but also as we write our own individual activities, how we need to, I believe, account for these issues, not just 
am I teaching students grammar point X, but what am I teaching them about the world beyond that? So, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Zero. Uh, I'm a bit concerned that all these fellows talk about so many foreign language students going for ourselves out of jobs here. Uh, we have uh, five minutes left, uh, well, a few four minutes. Uh, is there any questions for you you'd like to ask us? I guess we, if we have time. Um, I, I agree with the collaboration versus com competition aspect, you know, how it's tied to uh, majority English courses. Um, there's big push, I guess, recently for gamification in the classroom. Uh, how do you feel about that? The only thing... If, sorry, sorry to I, I didn't cut... He was saying that there's a, there's a push for gamification, that, that the idea that we where everything gets a point score and you do something, that sort of thing. I mean, it's hard for me because... I, actually, I left it on my desktop. The thing I do in my spare time is play games. That's what I do. And I left it on my desktop there because that's my hobby. So, for me, it's natural to want to use games in the classroom. But I've been trying to move away from it recently because my concern is that unless you design a game unbelievably well, the goal always becomes to win, and there's almost always a better way to win than doing English. There's always a side way. Um, it can be done, but it requires extreme precision. That's why when I use games in my classrooms, I almost never have, there are games that don't really have winners. Like they have a game-like feel, but the, the, it's, it's an activity, and I don't really reward the winner in every way. And that's actually what, what concerns me the most is there are some activities where it's like the winner gets candy, or the losers have to do extra homework. So you're telling the students who didn't do well in English they're going to be punished by doing English becomes punishment. And that is oh. particularly troublesome. That's pretty sure. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Like how, like you have the collaborative versus the competitive, but competitive games can actually provide very good teachable moments. How would you use more of the competitive games and turn it into more collaborable learning lessons? This is um, one of the things I didn't touch on here, but the people doing research on collaboration and competition just in terms of language classrooms. The suggestion has often been to move towards team games, to where the game itself is by definition both collaborative and competitive. But it has to be a team game where the teams are working together. Like if you have a quiz game and you bring one person from each group up and they do an answer and then they go back and they another person up, that's not a team game, that's not collaboration. But if you have some sort of activity where students have to work together and collectively achieve something, that can be getting the alleged excitement or fun of the game while also getting the key, you know, talking in English part. That's an interesting point. I was actually curious to know, was it quite difficult in some of the, uh, the TLT activities? were some of them quite difficult to categorize as either competitive or collaborative? Yes. Um, a good example would be two different activities that were basically mock job fairs. Mm -hmm. Students make a fake company and they come and interview. I classified one as collaborative and one as competitive, or sorry, one is basically solo and one is competitive, because the competitive one, the company actually chose a candidate at the end. Mm -hmm. The other one did not. They just did the interview and just kind of finished at the end and they talked about it. But one could argue that that's actually all competition because the job interview process is always a competitive one, at least here it is. Mm -hmm. So it was, it is very much a subjective judgment mm -hmm. in that case. It's also, I mean, it's, it's, there's also the argument you know, that that competitive element is part of life and the job. Right. Right. Okay. Maybe one very final question, quick comment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our last speakers today, we have uh, Mary Billis and Stu 